Good day. Good to be here with you uh, again, and thank you for inviting me into your, your places, wherever that may be today. Uh, here we are, oh, what is it, the 5th of October, or today's the 5th of October, it's Saturday, that I'm doing this video. But nonetheless, we're moving well into fall, and I pray and hope that uh, your fall has been a blessed of God, and that your families are blessed, and that as you prepare for, in Canada, Thanksgiving weekend, that you would be able to uh, just remember all the goodness and, and gratefulness and, uh, of God in your life, and all the blessings, and be grateful and thankful for those. We want to continue in our sermon series, A Living Hope, and please turn your Bibles to chapter one, uh, of chapter three of Peter, pardon me, and we will continue where we left off last week. Now, if you remember, over the last few weeks, we were focused uh, mostly our time on chapter 3, verse 8 to 12. Today, we're moving into 13. And we stated in that time that our words matter. Some might have the occasion to say, um, you know, words will never harm me, but we, we really know different, don't we? Our words are powerful either for good or for bad. The wisest man that ever lived said this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Solomon wrote that in Proverbs 18, 21. And of course, we have plenty of evidence, don't we, to support the wise Solomon as we look around our cultural context. For example, the digital space is filled with good words and with abusive and insulting words as well. David Mathis, in one of his articles called When They Hurt You With Words, reminds his readers that, quote, God has not left us without a guide for how to respond to the pain when we are persecuted with words. He goes on to point to the New Testament record filled with verbal attacks. Verbal attacks, of course, on Jesus, his apostles, and even the early church that we have recorded in the New Testament. And we find in these pages of the New Testament as well that these verbal attacks from time to time would escalate into physical persecution. A couple of examples here. Consider the imprisonment of Peter and Paul in the book of Acts in those early days of the church in Jerusalem. We have the stoning of Stephen, which is the first recorded martyr in the New Testament. And of course, we would be amiss if we didn't mention the crucifixion, crucifixion pardon me, of Christ as some of these examples. And Mathis was also right when he said this, quote, verbal persecution is not less than persecution, because it's verbal, and that's something uh, I agree with. Also, we have seen in our study of 1 Peter that our English New Testament really has primarily two words, revile and slander, for verbal attacks. And you know, if one were to do a general survey of uh, the early church, one would find that these early Christians were used to being verbally persecuted. We've also learned in our study of Peter's letter that to slander means to speak falsely against another, to, to injure someone with words. We remember then, of course, Jesus who endured mark, mockery and insult from many around him while he was uh, nailed to the Roman cross. And yet we know that Jesus did not respond in kind. Jesus endured. And not only did Jesus endure, Jesus prepared you and me for this as well. We have Jesus we have his apostles, and we have the early church. We have the church history modeling for you and me how to receive and respond to insult and reviling. Let's turn now, as I said, to 1 Peter chapter 3. We want to read from verse 13 to 17. 13 to 17. Verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, uh, righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, uh, for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. 
Thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this journey that we have been going through uh, Peter's letter here. We've been into this for a long time now, and I pray, Lord, that uh, those who are hearing this message today have been blessed, and that you have, by your Spirit, molded us and shaped us to become more and more like your Son, Jesus. And we pray all this, and we thank you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue where we left off last week, the Apostle Peter there offering guidance and instructions, uh, instruction to believers that were dispersed through five Roman uh, provinces of the day, present-day Turkey. The Apostle writing to encourage and give guidance to these first century believers who were experiencing various trials. Persecution coming from many different places and different ways for their faith in Christ. Remember that Christians in the first century were not seen at the very least as, were seen at the very least as distrustful. Overall, Christianity at this time of this letter was considered no different than other cults of the day as dangerous to the peace and order of that society. Christianity was seen, on, was seen as unfaithful to the emperor, unfaithful to the gods, and therefore a threat to the state. And as we have seen from verse Chapter 3, verse 8, and following these verbal persecutions would have been common response to the followers of Christ. We remember the Apostle Peter's exhortation uh, to his audience back in chapter 2, where he said to uh, these first century uh, Christians, abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against you and keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that they, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That was back in chapter 2, verse 13. Apostle Paul, we go to him, and he reminds us that our salvation in Christ was a free gift from God. It is the gift of grace which has saved all believers through faith alone. In the finished work of Christ, on a Roman cross for the sin of the world, for your sin, my sin, for these first century uh, believers, their sin. Believers are God's, according to Paul, God's workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand. So these first century believers, up to and including you and me today, uh, should walk in these good works for the glory of God. And then finally, the Apostle Peter would say, all of you have unity of mind. That's back in verse 8 here, chapter 3. In other words, be of one mind. Be of one mind. This doesn't mean, of course, that believers will not have differences of opinions and even disagreements. We see this in the New Testament. We see this in our time as well. But to have unity of mind is to agree on the essentials of the faith as revealed to us through the Word of God. In these, we are to be one mind, or to be, have unity of mind. And when the church has a chain to this unity of mind, it looks like something. It walks like something. It speaks like something. It is visible. It is there. It's made manifest. In other words, it's revealed in our relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, and surely, absolutely, it will be revealed when, not if, believers, as these first century believers, as you and I, are verbally reviled and insulted for their allegiances to Christ. So what does it look like? Well, Paul, uh, Peter reminded his audience and reminds us today, it looks like sympathy, to be sympathetic, brotherly love, a tender heart, that empathetic uh, heart, and a humble mind. It's all in verse 9. It looks like not repaying evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Not evil for evil, Peter would say. Instead, bless to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Not to insulting, yes, to keeping your tongue from evil. Not to reviling, yes, to turning from evil and doing good. No to revenge and yes, to pursuing peace. It's all right here, verse 8 through the twelve. Paul Peter continues then his instructions with the unity of believers in mind. And the scene continues on through the rest of Peter's letter. And now here at verse 13, the apostle asked his audience this question. Now who is there to harm you? Harm, pardon me. Now who is there to harm if you are zealous for what is good? 
So what did Peter mean? Are we to understand this to mean that those who are eager, that's another way of saying zealous, to do good, there's a less chance to be persecuted, to be reviled, to be insulted? Sure. That's reasonable. A general rule, when one does good to others, rarely is the response abusive or hateful. But hold the bus, Gus. The very next verse, the Apostle Peter said this, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Verse 14, first half of it. So Peter, do you mean if believers do good to others, they may still suffer for doing that good? Short answer, yes. So I have a question for us to consider, to ponder, to think through. Is being a Christian easy? Let's just change up that question a bit. Is following Jesus easy? Now, considering our popular evangelical culture in the 21st century here in the West, influenced, of course, we must agree there, by the individualistic and consumeristic society, that following Jesus, eh, it's not that hard. As long as we can squeeze in a little Jesus here and there, you know, along with all the other things we want to do, sure, following Jesus isn't that hard. And then we have Job. God described Job this way back in Job chapter 1, verse 8. There is none like him, speaking of Job, on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And then what seemed just like a brief moment later, this blameless and upright man witnessed the death of his children or experienced the death of his children, the loss of his, his wealth, his, his, his health, and even his wife said, curse God and die. So how would Job answer our question, is following God easy? Or how about Jeffrey Bull? Now, Jeffrey Bull, you know, he had this passion, this burden for the people of Tibet. So he, off he went to Tibet to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the Tibetans. And for his efforts, Jeffrey would endure three years in Chinese prison. Three years filled with mental torture, of course. Could you imagine? Not to mention the physical suffering that came along with it. How would Jeffrey answer a question? Is following Jesus is easy? Yes, friends. Doing good to others generally does not result in abuse and reviling in return. But, Peter is clear, if a believer should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Verse 14. I want us to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. Uh, Take your time, get there as I explain some points. We there, in that particular chapter, we find Jesus calling his 12 disciples, and there's a record of a list of their names there. And then Jesus sends these 12 uh, disciples, these 12 apostles, out. And he said to them, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Then Jesus warned them. He said, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Further along, he would say, they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. Again, further along, Jesus said, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So have no fear of them, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now all this you'll find at Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 1 to 33. Maybe you can read that after this message. The Apostle Peter... Back in our letter here, said to his audience facing persecution, for their faith in Jesus, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Fear of who? Well, the person or persons slandering the believer, reviling the believer. Remember what Peter said earlier in his letter. He said, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in the steps. You find that back in chapter 2, verse 20, 21. So how long ago we dealt with that indeed. 
But there it is. So then if verbal and or physical persecution comes your way, Paul continue, uh, Peter continues, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Second half of verse 15, the first half. Uh, second half of verse 14, the first half of verse 15. 14b, 15a. Here the apostle provided an alternative to fear. Focus on someone else. Focus on someone else. Well, the ESV that I use translates the Greek verb hagiadzo, hagiadzo, honor. The NIV uses revere, and the New King James uses sanctify. Now, typically or usually, hagiadzo means to make holy, to sanctify, to set apart. Yet the context in which it is being used here in our text, this verb means treat as holy, regard reverently, reverently, rever reverently. I have a hard time with that word tonight. Again, we're going to turn back to Matthew's gospel. This time we're going to go to Matthew 6. And there we find Jesus' teaching about prayer, and then he gave an example of how a believer could pray. Do you remember how he began that prayer? Jesus said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Notice the phrase, hallowed be. Here we have the same imperative, the same verb as Peter's text, agiadzo. And clearly, we see in Jesus' prayer, he begins by regarding God reverently, with reverence. So here's the point. When facing verbal and or physical persecution, instead of fear, the believer should acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. Rather than the fear of man, a reverent fear of Christ reinforces that Christ is sovereign in each and every circumstance, in each and every situation that comes along in a believer's life. So if you are threatened or troubled for your good works, set apart Christ as Lord. Set apart Christ as Lord. So in response to persecution, verbal otherwise, a believer, as someone once said, quote, should choose to run to God. Now, of course, one could choose to uh, be uh, put away from God in their persecution. But listen to what James uh, said in his letter. He put it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James 4, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Yet there's more. Peter goes on. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the, good, for the hope that is in you. Now we can keep in our minds that the Apostle Peter and his audience were facing uh, various trials and tribulations for their faith in Christ. So it seems the Apostle recognized that persecution for their faith in Christ would be an opportunity, as he said, to make a defense for the hope they had in Christ. A hope that the Apostle had called earlier in his letter, back in chapter 1, verse 3, a living hope. Notice this phrase then, make a defense. Verse 15. The NIV translates the original language, give an answer. Either way, the sense here is to reply to an accusation. A believer's stance toward unbelievers in this kind of circumstance should never be passive or neutral. The book of Acts, we can go there. You can go there if you want, from chapters 21 to 28. Maybe read that later as well. Recounts the events, if you remember, of the Apostle Paul's journey to Jerusalem, his eventual arrest in the temple of Jerusalem, and then he would end up in Rome at the end of that letter. As one reads through the final eight chapters of Acts, you will encounter, they will encounter the Apostle Paul speaking in his own defense. So after his arrest in Jerusalem, spoke, Paul spoke before the ruling Jewish council. And from there he was sent to Felix, the governor of Judea at the time, where Paul made his defense before Felix. And when Agrippa and Bernice, we see that in chapter 25, showed up in the governor's courts, Paul made his defense in their presence as well. My friends, the point is this. The Apostle Paul was not passive nor neutral as he made his way to Rome where he would be eventually executed for his faith in Christ. 
This great missionary apostle, apostle seized the opportunity to bear testimony, to witness to Christ. So this brings us to some more questions, does it not? Has anyone ever hated on you? That's another way of saying reviled. Has anyone ever reviled on you or hated on you? Do you remember how that felt? Has anyone ever slandered you? How did that feel? Here's another question. How did you respond? And did you know that God hates slander? We again turn to the wisest man that ever lived. We go to Proverbs um, Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Let me see. Yeah, Proverbs 6. Please turn there if you want. Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19. God hates slander. God hates it. Let's read Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. And one who sows discord, discord among brothers. A false witness who breathes out lies. Who insults someone. Um, remember what the Apostle Peter said earlier in verse 9. Do not repay evil for evil. Well, slander is evil. And even the Apostle Paul lists slander as the behavior of those who hate God. We go to Romans chapter 1, verse 29 and 30. There Paul said, They are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God. And speaking of gossip, someone once said this, Gossip spreads the fire, but slander sparks it. My friends, slander and gossip are destructive and serious sins. So then I have to ask this question again. How did you respond when you were hated on, when you were insulted? The Apostle Peter said here in verse 15, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with slander and reviling. No, do it with gentleness and respect. I want us to go back to Apostle Paul, to his letter to Colossae. There Paul said to the Colossian church, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So, again, I must ask, how did you respond? It is not our natural tendency is to revile back, to insult back. Again, the wise Solomon said this, a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Anger, not anchor, anger. Uh, Proverbs 15.1. Let me ask you another question. Do you want a good conscience? Do you want a good conscience, a good healthy conscience? The Apostle Peter wanted that for his audience. Have you ever regretted your words? If you answer yeah, yes, that's your conscience. A conscience under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Here's the point. If you are persecuted for your faith in Christ and you respond with gentleness and respect, your conscience will be in good shape and your good behavior in Christ will put those who persecute you to shame. I want to read uh, from uh, a book put out many, many years ago by Charles R. Swindoll, Pastor Swindoll. Maybe some of you have familiar with this gentleman who's just retired from ministry, I think just recently at the age of 90. <coughs> Pardon me. So, Pastor Swindoll, and it's called Another Chance. Instant replays have become old hat. We now expect them in all televised sports, whether it's an impressive backhand or a slam dunk or a touchdown pass. We, have, we never have to worry about missing it the first time around. It'll be back again and again and probably again in slow motion at least once. If it's good enough, in super slow motion. Every coordinated movement, every graceful or powerful motion returns to be analyzed by a fan and announcer alike. It occurred to me recently that I enjoy, for the lack of a better title, 
delayed replays of some of the more, more significant times in my life. Not photographs, fixed frames on film that can go into an album, but delayed replays. I'm fantasizing the possibility of going back and, giving another ch and being given another chance to relieve a particular experience that could have been handled differently, more wisely, with greater tact, in better taste. You know all those if I had that to do over again thoughts. Wouldn't that be neat? We'd all benefit from that, wouldn't we? Just think of all the things you'd refrain from saying that you blurted out the first time round. And consider the different attitudes we would have toward unexpected interruptions, unplanned babies, unrealistic expectations, unimportant details. I'll tell you, it would be a whole other story the second time round, wouldn't it? Even everybody's friend, Irma Bombeck, the gal you'd think would never regret a moment, agrees. Re recently, she admitted, if I had my life to live over again, I would, have, I would have waxed less and listened more. Instead of wishing away nine months of pregnancy and complaining about the shadows over my feet, I'd have cherished every minute of it and realized that the wonderment growing inside me was to be my only chance in life <clears throat> to assist God in a miracle. I would have cried and laughed less while watching TV and more while watching life. There would have been more I love yous, more I'm sorries, more I'm listening. But mostly, given another shot at life, I would seize every minute of it and never give that minute back until there was nothing left of it. Unfortunately, life doesn't offer delayed replays. Second times around don't happen. We cannot re-rear our children. I cannot re-pastor my first church. Initial impressions cannot be made, remade. Cutting remarks cannot be reset. Scars can't be completely removed. Tear stains on the delicate fabric of our emotions are, more often than not, permanent. Memories are fixed, not flexible. You mean God won't forgive? Well, you know better than that. And people can't overlook my failures? Come on now. That's not the issue at all. Most people I know are amazingly understanding. Our biggest task is forgiving ourselves. The main message is clear. Think before you speak, pause before you act, act, make every minute count. Another chance, no chance. Today is memory in the making, a deposit in the bank of time. Let's make it a good one. Well, I want to leave the last word to the wisest man that ever lived, King Solomon, who at the end of uh, his uh, book that he that is called Ecclesiastes said this, King Solomon said, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Folks, let us pray together. Lord, we thank you. I ask your uh, blessing on our time as we continue on this week. And Lord, I think of Thanksgiving weekend. I thank you for this message and the lessons that we can learn in here about what we say and what we do and how we respond to those circumstances around our lives, our lives the good, the bad, and the ugly ones. Lord God, help us to be uh, kind and compassionate. Help us to forgive. Help us to remember, as uh, Chuck Smundall so wisely said, to make our time count. For the honor and glory of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.